so good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen regular meeting for Monday, October 18th. As we do with all of our meetings, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, folks. Okay, at this point, we will open public session. If there's any members of the public who wish to address the board, please come up to the podium, state your name for the record, and uh, and you know the you know the drill. Hi, I I'm, wasn't here for this purpose, but because I'm here, this I'm Jenny Emery, 71 Loomis Street. Last spring. I sent you all a letter and then I zoomed in and, and encouraged you to please engage a professional oh, to search for our new town manager. Yes, and I just wanted to acknowledge that I'll be darned, you got the job done and I wanted to thank you very much, especially Sally and Scott. I know you did the heavy lifting, but I know what it is to be hiring a senior manager for an organization like this, having done it on the superintendent side. So I just yeah. wanted to acknowledge um, I think you've done good, so welcome, Erica. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's reserving judgment. I know. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. Anyone else wish to address the board? Boy, I like when it's something positive like that. Yeah, this is great. Eight years. Eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Only took eight years. That's great. Um, any going once? Going twice? We will close public session. I'll look for approval of the. Meeting minutes for October 4th. Make a motion to approve. Second. Discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension. Motion carries. Thank you. No unfinished or tabled business. We'll look for uh, resignations. Are you aware? None. None? The resignations that we have received are on the, the uh, this uh, business A. Uh, the okay. lower firm from River and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Committee. Any appointments, Mark? So, no. Yes. 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 Uh, the Affordable Housing Committee. I believe they're supposed to be representative or intended to be from the Board of Selectmen. I'd like to nominate myself. I was going to nominate. I'll you. second that. Okay. <laughs> so we have a nomination and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstention, but get all choked up when you get on the board, Mark. All right, congratulations, Mark, and thank you. Um, let's see, we have uh, Farmington Valley Health District. Do you want to speak sure. to that? Uh, the reason this is on the agenda is uh, the town of Granby gets two representatives on the board of the Farmington Valley Health District. And um, right now, most recently, you appointed Sandy Yost, our uh, human services director, to that position. But um, I feel strongly that the town manager should be on the board. The health district, as we all know, over the last 18 to almost 24 months now has been an integral piece of our, our government in, in the valley. And, and the district does a wonderful job. And it's really just an extension of another department in my eyes. Mm -hmm. So I would really like to be um, on that committee um, as a board member. Well, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Erica Robertson, our town manager, to the Farmington Valley Health Just District. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. And we do have, uh, what's the other one? Lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook. Wild and Scenic Committee. Yep, there are two, two vacancies on that. Um, after many years, two of the members um, have uh, ended their their membership on that board for, for all good reasons, but um, we are looking for people for that committee. Great. Thank you very much. All right. At this point, we will turn to item B, presentation of Holcomb Farm update by the president, Bob Bistrowski. Mr. Bistrowski. Thank you very much. Thank you. First Selectman Conley, board members, town manager Robertson. My name is Bob Bistrowski. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with this annual update with the Friends of Holcomb Farm. 
Uh, I understand we have other business tonight, including my children's elementary school. So I will uh, keep it brief. I'll take only an hour and then leave enough time for questions. <laughs> the Friends is a charitable organization. We were formed almost 30 years ago to honor the legacy of Tudor and Laura Holcomb, whose family maintained the farm since the 1800s. Tudor was born at the farm on Simsbury Road in 1886. His sister Laura was born in 1888. Both Tudor and Laura were extremely generous throughout their lives. Tudor donated the land for the West Granby Methodist Church. He donated the land upon which this town hall and library complex is built. And there's a plaque that references that in the, in the uh, lobby. Uh, both Tudor and Laura were very much wanted their legacy to be the preservation of their family farm, but not as a museum. They wanted this so much so that the farm was originally do donated to Yukon in the hopes that it would become an agricultural campus and an adjunct to stores. When Yukon failed to act on that generous gift, the town of Granby stepped up and brought the farm back to Granby in 1992. Afterwards, people gathered, committees were formed, public meetings were held, and many ideas were considered for the farm. It was suggested that it could be a site for new schools, it could be athletic fields, it could be a concert venue, ice skating rink, many more ideas were thrown out there. Finally, and I think appropriately, it was decided by the community and the town leadership that the farm should be preserved as what it is, a farm, for the use and enjoyment of the entire Granby community. The Friends of the Farm was established with a simple and clear mission to preserve, promote, and utilize an historic working New England farm. And that is what we are honoring today as the Friends. Throughout the past 30 years, there have been innumerable citizen volunteers that have contributed to the success and present preservation of the farm. Many of those same citizens have and continue to serve on numerous town boards and commissions. And they include a number of people. Jenny Emery serves on our Board of Education, Eric <coughs> Lukenbeal, Jack LaRoe, Jim Lofink, who served on your board, Gordy Bischoff, who served Board of Finance for many years, and he was our, our first grant czar at Holcomb Farm. Al Wilkie, Cal Hemingway, Paula Johnson, and Mr. O'Hannison, I have many fond memories of you being the calm voice on the phone during my early years when you supported our finance committee in many, many crises. From 1992 until 2012, the Friends organization were solely financially responsible for all of the maintenance, operations, and programming at the farm. Since then, the town operates the main campus and leases the farmhouse, office, CSA barn, and acreage to the Friends by way of a license agreement or a lease. There is no subsidy to the Friends organization. So what is it that the Friends do at the farm? We have three primary programs, farming, fresh access, and stewardship. These are outlined in our annual report, which I will provide you copies of as as I conclude tonight, but can also be found on our website, which is holcombfarm.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, but I can't help you with that. <laughs> uh, first of all, the farming program. Uh, in 2020, we, our crew, under the leadership of our farm manager, Joe O'Grady, who lives in the farmhouse previously occupied by Tudor Holcomb so many years ago, worked tirelessly along with his crew to grow and distribute all of the fresh chemical-free produce promised to a sold-out summer community-supported agricultural program. We had over 350 family members in 2020. And our ongoing efforts to grow the growing season and extend that season last year resulted in a record-setting 150 winter shares to be provided to people as well. Um, 
We had some noteworthy fine, uh, farming achievements last year. We purchased a used cultivating tractor. We uh, used Pomeroy Brace grant funds to purchase a propagation house, a mulch retriever, barrel washer, greenhouse exhaust system. We obtained a USDA COVID grant and we purchased a delivery van for our fresh access program that you'll hear about in a moment. And also, we bolstered our farming capital reserve, which as of year-end 2020 stands at $30,000. By March 2021, the summer CSA was again sold out, the ultimate testament to the success of our prior year. Going forward, we have a five-year farm business plan. We have a revised strategic plan. We have a lot of projects and a lot of plans for the future and, and things are uh, going very well. The Friends of the Farm are a member of the Granby Agricultural Commission, a very active member. We participate in Open Farm Day. We support local farm sales and the uh, holiday market at Lost Acres Vineyard. We offer produce and other items uh, produced by local farms at our farm store at Holcomb Farm. And we, I would encourage any local producer to contact us if, if you'd like to be featured in our farm store. We see ourselves as members of the very large and successful Granby agricultural community. 2021, the season that we're in the midst of now, was a much more challenging year for our farm manager as heavy rains created horrible conditions for growing produce. What I learned this year is drought is no problem for a farmer, assuming they can obtain water and water the fields, but when you have too much rain, there's nothing you can do about it. So it was, it was a real challenge. Our Fresh Access is the other program that I mentioned. And this is a program that's the focus uh, of Mark Fiorentino, who's a Board of Ed member, who's here tonight. He's a member of our Board of Directors. In 2020, our Fresh Access program provided approximately 12 tons, 24,000 pounds of fresh produce to thousands of people in need, both in our community and surrounding communities. Fresh Access is the largest service program of the Friends of Holcomb Farm. We focus first on people in Granby. We provided free shares of the harvest to 11 Granby families identified by social services. We worked with our community partners to distribute the thousands of pounds of produce to our clients and members. These partners include the Granby Senior Center, where there's a weekly distribution of produce from, from Holcomb Farm, and perhaps uh, for Selectman Conley and O'Hannison and Ballard, you, you now, as you retire, can participate in that distribution. <laughs> we also partner with the Waste Not What Not Community Kitchen. Healing, Meal, Healing Meals Community Project, uh, which is based in Simsbury, but also services a lot of folks in Granby, Granby that are suffering uh, with a family and member with a health crisis. We also work together with the Hispanic Health Council and Wheeler Clinic. Both of those organizations are based in Hartford, but they uh, contribute to allowing us to provide them with produce, which helps the need in those areas. This year, we have plans to extend our delivery season with our partners to mid-November, provide more grab-and-go grab type produce to our partners, and maintain the amount of produce we provide to the Senior Center, Waste Not, Want Not, and other local Granby partners, which has doubled over the last five years. We also are providing fruit produced from local farms and purchased from local farms to our partners and some of that fruit comes from Clark Farms and other fruit is donated by Thrall Farms. And Sarah, as you may know, is a member of the Board of Education. Stewardship is another program. We are stewards of the land. There's almost 400 acres at Holcomb Farm and, and what I learned from Mark Williams' book is that uh, Tudor was responsible for the growth of the family farm. He roughly doubled the acreage during his his time there. We uh, have a tree trail 
and we've planted trees. In 2020, we planted 21 trees, and here's, here's some of those trees for those of you who are interested in the trees. Amur Machia, sourwood, eastern redbud, hawthorn bean, horn bean, yellow wood, sweet gum ginkgo, and bald cypress. We also planted three Zelkova trees in the island at Holcomb Farm because the other trees there were dying. We worked with Mr. Severance and Public Works, removed the dying trees, and replaced those with Zelkova trees. The trees were purchased from uh, Rare Earth Nursery in New York, Bosco's in Simsbury, and some trees were donated by John O'Brien at O'Brien Nursery on Wells Road. Volunteers spent many hours in 2020, at which time we had a drought, as you may recall, bringing water up to those new trees in five-gallon pails <laughs> and keeping those trees alive. This year, not so much necessary. Trail stewardship. We maintain dozens of miles of walking trails, which during this pandemic have been a real blessing and used by, by many people in town. Uh, we have volunteers such as Walter Ford, who's a neighbor on, on Day Street, and Jack LaRoe. They, they help mow the walking paths to keep them manageable, keep the ticks away, allow people to walk the trails. Peggy LaRoe is a volunteer, recruited and organized a group of trail stewards to maintain the woodland trails. They walk their assigned trails periodically and advise the committee of hazards such as fallen trees and help remove them. We uh, remove invasives uh, that are there on the east side, up on the east side if you're at the farmhouse looking across the street. We helped a 950 foot long hedgerow that's been reclaimed. And invasive plants were removed to make way for pasture grass and four more oak trees. Invasive plants were also removed around the farmhouse. The Department of Public Works, with the support of Kirk Severance, helped clear and chipped extensive areas of invasive plants on both sides of the road going up the east side. So if you walk up to the sea, that road is now clear and the invasives are no longer encroaching on you. And that was all due to the support of Public Works with, with equipment and manpower as they could, helping us maintain that area. Uh, the trail use. Like most outdoor recreation spaces during the pandemic, the Woodland Trails and the Holcomb Tree Trail saw a significant increase in use as people sought out this, the safety of outdoor activities. However, recent severe storms washed out our footbridge at the West Side Trails leading to Broad Hill. And that's something we're working with Mr. Severance on to get back in serviceable condition. We worked with the Granby Lions Club to fund the construction and installation of a trail kiosk, which, would dis which will display the Holcomb Tree Trail map. We also have QR codes where you can put your phone up and the map will show up on your phone, which will allow you to have the, the trails on your phone so you won't get lost. With funding from a Pomeroy Brace Grant, we created interpretive signs for the tree trail which have been installed. So if you walk up on the east side where you'll see some trees, there will be walking paths, and you'll see interpretive signs that describe what you're looking at, whether it's the hills in the distance or the farm itself, um, and, and you'll get a little history lesson. We um, obtain grants from several organizations uh, in our 501c3 status allows us to do that. And, that includes the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. We obtained, I mentioned, a USDA grant for COVID relief. And in 2020, our total assets increased by $161,381 year over year, driven primarily by the strong and successful farming operations and the grants. Cultivation, that's what we call membership and growing, growing our members. The, the town is a member. We, we together with the town are members. And we have family members as well, individuals. We now have 697 members as of June 2021, which is a healthy increase from the past. 
And that includes both folks who support the CSA, the agriculture program, as well as people who make an annual donation to become friends of the farm. We have an education program that we continue to hope to expand over time, but just in the past few months, we hosted students from St. Joseph's College, a hydrology class came to the farm, and also from Granby Memorial High School, AP Environmental Sciences classes came to the farm. And uh, we hope to continue expanding those educational services that have always taken place at the farm. In closing, we're excited that the <coughs> town has been able to turn the campus into a revenue generating town asset. And we continue to look forward to working with the town as it tackles the capital reinvestment needed with priorities being the farmhouse and the bridge to the walking trails on the other side of Broad Hill. But again, I thank you all very much for allowing me the opportunity to come here tonight. I am pleased to take questions if you have any. Any questions? <clears throat> Thanks. Just a, just a quick question. Um, have you, one of the things in the last uh, probably couple of years that's really come to the forefront of my thoughts was the, the preservation of that land. Have you or your committee given any thoughts of that? Yes. It is a town asset, but, you know, 20 years, 10 years, three months from now, it, it could be sold. Um, have you thought about, you know, forever preserving that property? Yes. It, it's something we're, we're very focused on. As I mentioned in my comments, you know, as I looked back on all of the documents and all of the thought and efforts by all the town leaders put into bringing the farm back. Bill Smith was a big part of that. We went to the legislature literally and said, we need this farm back. That was the focus. There were discussions of all kinds of things. All kinds of ideas were presented. But what it came down to is people really wanted to preserve that farm. Mm -hmm. and, and we feel very strongly about that, that that is something in our strategic plan that we should be working towards. Mm -hmm. I understand there's two sides to that. I understand folks are concerned that we don't want to tie our hands if there's some other use, but there is no other use for that property that, that's as wonderful and terrific and beneficial to the community as its current use. And ensuring that stays that way forever, mm -hmm. I think, has a lot of value. And it's something we look forward to working with the town leadership uh, to make happen. But thank you. Okay. I, I would like to present to you, if I may approach, Sure. Um, copies of our annual report, which is which is very impressive, right? Um, and for very limited, for the folks who will not be rejoining this board, I have a small gift of nominal value. <laughs> you're, you're getting close. <laughs> Stand down. Stand down. Um, and for, for those who are not receiving the small gift of nominal value tonight, you are getting an annual report. Thank you, Bob. But you also receive a gift in the future. Thank but your gift. Thank you very much. Service. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. And thanks to your whole team for all you guys do at Holcomb Farm. It's, I do uh, one for the minutes, though. Yeah, so. You can have Thank you very much. It's Appreciate obviously it. a great asset, Bob. And and what you guys have done over the years is, is outstanding. So thank you. Well, again, it's, it's been my pleasure to serve, and I, and I continue to serve. Oh, I do, I do have my other copies. There we go, Mr. Cummings. Um, but again, thank you uh, to all of you for your support. And again, a lot, is, a, lot is, a lot of good things have been happening at the farm recently. And during your tenure for Selectman Cumley, the North Barn was renovated. Uh, although I will remind you that that was assisted by a substantial six-figure contribution from friends. <laughs> but, but again, you a, lot of, me all the time. It's a awesome. lot of effort and money went into that, and a lot of work by the town, and, and that's one example of how the entire community can really mm -hmm. use this asset and, and uh, receive a benefit from it. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Look at this. We get, it's a nice hat. This is, this is nice. And it goes big to fit my fat head, which is good. So, lucky me. Okay. So, next we have our presentation for current school. Do you sure. want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, we thought it would be a good idea for our consultants, Goldman and York, to come to us today and give us another 
presentation about the market and the industry and what's going on out there. What can be done at Kern School? What, what have they done for us over the last 10 months since their engagement? And, um, you know, we're, we're moving to a point where, you know, we'd like to make decisions on this property. And I think this informational uh, session now would be helpful to everybody. So Mike Goman is here to, to help with Andy and Patata and, I'm, and their new employee, who's a Granby <laughs> resident, or no, was. That's right. no, my, that's myself. There's okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's quite a story of uh, the farm and the great community asset. It's not for sale. It's not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the market industry we're looking for tonight. <laughs> See, you you got to have See I'm, I'm going to have all this free time. I could help the farm out. This would be good. So, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Goldman. I'm a principal at Goldman and York Property Advisors. Uh, with me tonight are Andy DeFada, our Senior Vice President. Andy's here because he's been kind of a point man on a lot of the day-to-day -day work. And also Sam Bartos, who's an Associate Broker, just joined us. Sam just joined us. And uh, as uh, uh, Erica pointed out, Sam's a uh, Grammy resident. So uh, he was hanging around the office this morning. And he looked like he needed something to do on a Monday night. So I said, do you come with us? He's a great hire. Yeah, I, I, we think so. Good hire. Yeah, we're quite good to hear that. Um, so, as, as Erica pointed out, we're your advisors on the Kern School property, and uh, we're here to talk to you about that tonight. Uh, I'm going to go through a, an industry overview, as was mentioned, and then we'll talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing uh, directly on the Kern School project. So, um, my background, uh, by the way, I was a 25-year resident of Simsbury and on the board, of, the board of Ed there for 17 years. Uh, Andy, who's with us uh, as a Simsbury resident, was previously president of Vincent Bickford Realty. Uh, and as I mentioned, Sam's a Grammy resident. So uh, this is a little bit about me. I've been doing this work all my life, so 40 years plus. I grew up in Northern Ontario in Canada, uh, where my family owned a sawmill. And we were in the real estate business before I really realized that there was actually a thing called the real estate business. And uh, since then, I've worked all across Canada and uh, virtually all of the US states and some overseas assignments on a lot of projects. Our firm is based in East Hartford. We're a small firm, a couple of dozen people do what, uh, what we do here tonight. Uh, and I've put up some of our clients, you know, institutions and lenders and municipal agencies and so on. So a lot of experience uh, with this kind of work. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the industry and some projections and considerations. Uh, a little bit about how the development process is changing, as it always is. Uh, we've got some slides in here on advice for uh, people that are in your role, I mean municipalities, and then we'll talk about the, the school. So let's do a little bit of industry overview information. Uh, and I've broken it down really into the big sectors, uh, the industry sectors. First being office. As you can imagine, this work from home thing has really punished uh, office occupancy dramatically. Uh, we follow, uh, for example, uh, uh, we're very data driven. We follow uh, uh, physical occupancy of office space in Manhattan, among other things. And as of last Friday, that had uh, reached its recent peak of 36%. I mean, that means 63% of the office space in Manhattan is sitting there vacant some year and a half after all this started. Uh, Hartford is running a little less than that, about 30% uh, actually occupied. So it's been pretty hard on the office segment. Uh, the work from home, we think, is going to continue post-pandemic. That's something that should be of a lot of concern to markets that have uh, a heavy component of office. Uh, most markets, especially North Central Connecticut, have historically run about 20% uh, vacant. So 80% occupied, uh, financially occupied, and 20% vacant. If in the post-COVID uh, era, that vacancy goes, say, from 20% to 30 or 35 or 40%, that's dead. None of those office properties uh, that have been finally are all financed. None of them are financed on the basis of being 30 or 35% vacant. So that's, that's a real problem. And we're, we're kind of holding our breath to wait and see what's going to happen. Retail, I mean, record closings in mostly department store type merchandise, specialty goods. On the other hand, there's a lot of openings in things like general merchandise and home improvement just because people that's what people are buying right now. Uh, sad state of affairs in some ways, uh, with all the respect to our friends at Dollar General, but I mean the biggest category in retail in the last few years 
has been people like Family Dollar and Dollar General. Dollar General continues to open up about a thousand new stores a year. So uh, tough time, and uh, it's going to be that way for a while. Restaurants particularly hit the local guys. Uh, about a third of them are, are likely to never reopen. Uh, hospitality, if you're in the uh, resort business, you're, you're starting to see things come back. If you're a roadside hotel on an interstate highway at an interchange, catering mostly to business people, you're probably in trouble and you're, you're probably going to be in trouble for a while. Uh, travel, of course, is, continues to be down. It's come back. Uh, we watch the uh, weekly travel data and it's, it's definitely coming back. Uh, we're not seeing that in room nights in those business-oriented hotels yet. And I think it'll be quite a while before we see that. Single-family development. Uh, the for sale, uh, it's down significantly, but it has been down and it was down pre-COVID. It tends to very much track population <coughs> growth. Uh, what's called build to rent, BTR, that's seeing just enormous growth, particularly in the southern markets. Uh, that's a 1,200 square foot, two bedroom house uh, on a, you know, an eighth of an acre lot and they build it and they, they build it to rent. They rent it for about $1,600 a month and there's a lot of people that are doing that in the southern markets. Multi-family development, that's really apartments and condos. Uh, that's a hot area. Uh, we're going to see substantial growth continuing in that. Uh, the interesting segment uh, the, uh, of apartments, the renter segment of apartments, are the socioeconomic groups that we put up here uh, called empty nesters, double income, no kids, or dinks and new singles. So empty nesters basically are people like me, you know, where you were in a house in the suburbs for most of your life, your kids are growing and gone, you don't need the big house anymore, so you downsize and uh, you know, you're now maybe looking for an apartment, but those are great occupants because they want to stay in the community that they've been in for the years that they raised their family. Their doctors are there, their church is there, their uh, social contacts are there, the places they like to eat and shop and everything are there. So they're looking for these amenity-rich uh, apartment projects that they can move into and get out of cutting lawns and all that sort of stuff. Good example of that is Heirloom Flats down in Bloomfield. Uh, terrific project, 235 units, uh, all kinds of amenities uh, leased up. We thought it would lease up. We did the financial projections for it. We also did the work for the town of Bloomfield on that. And uh, uh, we thought it would take maybe 14 months to lease up, at least up in seven. Uh, New London just opened a similar project uh, right down the waterfront. 135 units uh, opened up in June, and it's uh, as of last Friday, it was 92% leased. So those are incredible lease-up rates. So empty nesters, the, the double income, no kids, that's the, the professional couple that maybe work at uh, uh, Hamilton Sons Grand, and, and they're both engineers, they're earning good money, they don't have kids yet, not quite ready to buy a house yet, uh, but they want to rent, a, uh, again, in this amenity-rich environment where there's all kinds of things. There's a ballet room, there's a yoga room, there's a golf simulator, there's an exercise room, outdoor barbecues, pools, dog washing stations, I mean, the list goes on and on. That's where they want to be in the prepared space rent. The good thing about them for communities is that if they move into your community into an amenity-rich environment, when they decide to buy a home, they're likely going to look for, place, look for a home in that community that they've been in for a few years because they now know it. Same reason empty nesters make that choice. New singles, they tend to be late 40s, early 50s, newly single, oftentimes as a result of a divorce. Professionals, uh, they, they don't want the house, they don't need the house anymore, and they're looking for that amenity-rich environment. So that's a real focus. I mean, everything we look at, and we're doing uh, work for about somewhere between 30 and 40 municipalities right now between Connecticut and Massachusetts. Every, almost every apartment project that we're seeing come out of the ground uh, is in that category. That, that amenity rich, really nice uh, project. And uh, from a town standpoint, they pay a lot of taxes. Those projects pay a lot of taxes. Condominiums, you know, it's, it's still, they're stable, uh, but we're not seeing a lot of production. Those are the for sale kind of units, and uh, we're just not seeing a lot of production. What I think will happen if, if uh, past history is a guide is we'll see apartments eventually convert over to condo development sold as condos at some point. So uh, general construction, keeping uh, going on with some of our sectors, uh, real problems. I mean, material shortages, volatility in the cost of lumber, and of course, land use restrictions and so on that, that slow things down. That's all going to continue for a while. 
uh, we've, we're probably uh, working on, on behalf of our clients, uh, somewhere around, I don't know, 30 or 40 million dollars worth of construction projects. And I mean, even, even small projects, two or 3,000 square feet, we're looking at seven and eight months for completion. Uh, just because they can't get the material they need. They can't get the, the VAV boxes or the HVAC equipment or some of the electrical stuff or some of the computer stuff, just not available. Um, warehouse logistics, like apartments, that's a real hot section of the industry right now. Uh, the demand nationwide for the foreseeable future is estimated to be around 300 million square feet of new warehouse logistics spaces per year, uh, off in as far out as you can predict. Uh, this has to be the modern high bay, it's got to be 34 feet high. The old 20, 22, 24 foot bay, high height uh, bays don't work anymore for these uh, robotic uh, materials handling uh, logistics centers. and. Uh, you know, we're just going to see that continue to be the case. Uh, I think Amazon now is up to about 80 of these kinds of facilities just in Connecticut alone. Uh, the biggest one you've probably seen uh, it, is at Route 20 at the entrance to the airport off of uh, 84. That's 3.6 million square feet. Uh, 91. Off of 91. Up, off of 91, pardon um, 3.6 million square feet It's the biggest building in Connecticut probably be the biggest building for the long time. Previously, the biggest building was the old J.C. JCPenney uh, distribution warehouse over in Manchester, which was 2.2 million square feet. Um, so huge. Now, the, the advantage of that, of course, that pays a lot of taxes. There's a lot of equipment in there. Uh, but the other advantage is, and, and we hear this from communities, that the warehouse logistics, those are, those are the guys, you know, lugging boxes and loading trucks. There are a few of those, but most of the people in these buildings now are operating very sophisticated computer-driven equipment, robotics, and so on. It's not, they're not, uh, there, there are some people left in boxes, uh, but not anywhere near what they used to be. Uh, so that's kind of the overview of what we see in the industry. We're expecting there's recovery to continue to kind of be a little bumpy. Uh, hopefully we don't get another re uh, Delta variant or anything like that. Uh, we think the duration, in other words, the impact of all this on the industry is going to be longer. And, uh, and perhaps more dramatic, and we just don't know what it is yet. Uh, we are seeing a lot of companies really rethink how they operate. Uh, some of that goes back to pre-COVID times uh, with the online re the movement toward online retail, uh, but a lot of it just got accelerated uh, because of the uh, whole COVID-19 thing. But in terms of rethinking business models, you're going to see retailers, for example, move to very, very much in the prototypes of their new stores uh, to a lot more uh, pickup areas. So when you go into a grocery store or a Target uh, store, they're gonna, there's going to be a much more uh, organized and dedicated area for curbside pickup, and including even drive-up. Uh, interesting that we've, we're now seeing a real return to drive-ups. For a while, nobody wanted them anymore, and now they're all coming back because of COVID. Uh, so transactional activity, this is the area where Sam's working in. Uh, a lot of deals were put on hold during COVID, but it's coming back. This bid-ask gap is uh, a lot wider. There's a lot of people that own property that think the property is worth a lot more than it really is in today's world, and maybe more than it's going to be in the next few years. Uh, leasing, we, we're seeing impact on the leasing side where we're not seeing it on the sales side. Uh, the leasing side, we are seeing rents coming down and a lot more incentives, free rent and so on being put on the table to attract tenants and fill space. Uh, so the focus of uh, any development activity is going to be really in the best markets and with the best tenants and properties. Uh, that's mostly the southern markets that are continuing to grow with, you know, 10 percent uh, rates. Uh, we've got markets in the south that grew 30 percent over that decennial period uh, up to the latest census uh, data that was just released. Uh, so we're seeing the mo the, much of the activity concentrated there. North Central Connecticut is very stable. We're just not seeing a lot of growth. Uh, the uh, projects that are going to be done are ones which have really high, uh, very reliable NOI and operating income and, and can be perceived to be uh, resilient, sort of in a little insulated from the market. And in those sectors that I talked about, uh, industrial and multifamily rental. Uh, consumer behavior is changing. Uh, we've seen a lot of these changes as we've gone uh, through this whole COVID thing. Uh, the buy online, pick up in store, that's what I was talking about that's driving the change in store prototypes. Uh, buy now, pay later has really emerged as a, 
a new thing, you know, it goes back to the, almost the days of layaways, if you remember those in stores years ago. Uh, the buy now, buy now, pay later is really revived. And we're actually starting to see, hear reports of people, customers stockpiling uh, certain merchandise uh, because they're concerned that there's going to be shortages. So this, paper. <laughs> consumer behavior has changed and will continue to change, I think. Uh, what are we telling people to watch? On the debt side, uh, there's a lot less debt available, but the debt is in those areas that I mentioned that are troubled. You know, business, hotels, conference centers are in, are in big trouble, uh, unfortunately. So many conferences were uh, canceled and it takes a long time to <coughs> that business. Uh, these uh, local uh, retailers and dining, uh, where they had very low liquidity going into it, uh, makes it very tough for them to survive. And then travel industry. Also, nonprofits are getting hit just because contributions are, uh, have gone down in many cases. Uh, sectors that uh, everybody's watching, office buildings, of course, we've talked about that, shopping centers for obvious reasons. Uh, long term, we're advising municipal clients to really pay attention to the commercial uh, real estate component of their uh, tax base uh, because we're, we're going to see that as it plays itself out lower occupancy level erosion of retail erosion of uh, Restaurants and so on we're going to see these uh, Assessed values of commercial real estate drop and uh, you know, it's scary stuff if you think you look at uh, Blueback Square the, the one in, in West Hartford it was built uh, I think roughly 15 years ago now and the cost was around 160 million it sold in 2013 for about 110 million, uh, it was bought by a fund. Uh, it went broke uh, last year, last fall, and the fund just recently sold it for 42 million. So look at Enfield Square Mall was uh, assessed not that long ago at the 80 million dollar number. It sold a little while ago for 12. Uh, that's the kind of numbers we're seeing. I mean, they're shocking. We're seeing major regional malls that had. Values of 150 million sell for 8 million. You know, it's just that's the kind of when, when I go back to that slide about department store type merchandise. That's what those guys sold. Mall sold. That was and they they are getting hit hard here in Connecticut. Uh, Waterford down in uh, Crystal Mall down in Waterford, uh, Buckland Hills. Uh, the shops at Buckland Hills that went bankrupt a couple of months ago. That's in the hands of a receiver. Uh, Meriden Mall, same thing. Uh, so, you know, the, these things, and they, if you add in what's happening to office buildings on top of that, these are big tax paying entities, and suddenly they're in a lot of trouble. So, what we're doing with our municipalities is saying, let's help you look a little ahead. If you have a concentration in commercial real estate, let's look a little ahead, do some predictions about what the assessed values are going to be in the next few years, and start to plan around that a little bit. Um, as I said, a lot of this started in the 90s. Uh, we just ended up with too much retail and office uh, square footage. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak before, one of my comments is that it's not that we're overbuilt, it's that we're under demolished. Uh, we, we've got to take a lot of this stuff down. I mean, there's just not the users for it anymore. Uh, COVID exas exacerbated it. Uh, online went to a necessity. Work from home took off. You know, we're seeing companies say 30 to 50 percent of their people can work from home. That changes the amount of office square footage they need. If they went into the, this with uh, marginal numbers, marginal financial basis, uh, they're the ones that are going to be in the biggest trouble. Here's just a slide to illustrate it. This so, if looking around the U.S., we said, what about centers, shopping centers that have 400,000 square feet and up? There's roughly 2,700 of them across the U.S. More than 200,000 square feet and up, about 8,400. 200,000 square feet is, uh, if you think of the uh, little shopping center down at the bottom of Bushy Hill on uh, Route 44, where uh, Home Goods and Bed Bath and Beyond is, that's about 200,000 square feet. So we had 8,400 of those. If we said that in the top 50 MSAs, we had uh, roughly uh, and, and Hartford's number 48 on that list, M MSA being Metropolitan Statistical Area. Uh, if you said, just for fun, we had four Class A centers and four Class B centers in each one, Class A center being West Farms Mall at that level. Uh, if we had four each of uh, Class A and Class B, uh, it gave us, that gave us roughly 200 of each class in those top 50 MSAs, so 400. If we then go down to the next 50 MSAs, uh, Chattanooga, for example, is number 100, and we did the same math. 
Well, we end up with roughly 800 centers in that size. So that leaves roughly 1,900 centers that are 400,000 square feet or bigger that are in class C or worse. That's the ones that are gonna be in trouble. Serious, serious trouble. And that's a lot of shopping center square footage. Uh, so they're scary numbers, they're big numbers. Uh, the first quarter of next year, that's the quarter when a lot of retailers particularly uh, file for bankruptcy or reorganization and that, that has a big impact on, on uh, retail uh, organizations and particularly their landlords. And the reason that is is that most retailers do roughly uh, 40 to 60 percent of their volume in that holiday season, but more importantly that holiday season represents about 80 percent of their profit. So if they get through Christmas and they haven't had a good holiday season, they file in January. Most retailers are on a year end, end of January, end of January, year end. And that's when, that's the season when we see those announcements being made. Uh, so we're holding our breath. We're gonna wait and see how it goes. The supply chain issues aren't gonna help it any. Um, owners of this stuff, I mean, you know, income's declining, appraised values are declining, lenders are exiting uh, a lot of these sectors, especially office and retail. And we're, we're just looking forward and saying, you know, there's gonna be a lot more, another round of uh, foreclosures. Uh, new development of any size, you know, you're gonna see the family dollars, but new development of any size is gonna be pretty rare. Um, future outlook, you know, open air is gonna replace the closed suburban malls, no, no doubt about it. And uh, the uh, uh, horizontal mixed use apartment projects versus the vertical projects, that's gonna be more the trend. A lot more interest in suburban markets and a lot less interest in urban markets as people realize they can work from home and that means they can live out in Granby and work from Granby as opposed to having to live in New Haven, for example, or Boston or wherever it might be. Uh, I mentioned the takeout and drive up windows coming back in a big way. That's, that's hilarious, really. We, uh, we do work for about 130 banks and credit unions around the nation. And uh, a few years ago, you couldn't give away a, a bank branch with a drive through And now all the banks want drive throughs again, so we're back into it. And of course, the retail technologies and the freestanding store prototypes are all changing. That whole market is gonna change, continue to change for a while. Uh, tougher leases, it's become a tenant's market. Uh, a lot of focus on what we call experiential retail, which the best way to understand that is this generation, this next generation, Sam's generation, doesn't, they're not, they don't look at shopping, for example, as a, uh, an interesting way to spend a few hours. You know, back in the 80s, people would spend, uh, the average American would spend about 12 hours a month in a shopping center of one type or another. That number has dropped down to less than three hours a month. Uh, it's a chore now. So what are they looking for? <laughs> you, you buy into that? Well, what they're looking for now is uh, feed me, entertain me, give me something to do with my friends, teach me something, that's the experiential side of retail. So we're gonna see a lot more emergence of new concepts uh, around giving people an experience. Of course, the growth areas like gas and convenience, auto parts, dollar stores, and cannabis stores, that, those, stuff, those things are gonna continue to grow. Uh, quick service restaurants, we think those will continue to grow, go, uh, to grow because of the drive-through component. And we're seeing a lot of smaller format stores like Target and Ikea and so on. All these, all these guys rolling out 30,000 foot prototypes that they're testing now. Of course, you've probably read that Amazon's doing the same. Amazon has got a whole series of test stores uh, across the country and in England now that they're ro rolling out. So uh, redevelopment opportunities, this is what it drives it. You know, the demographics and the socioeconomic components of your market. Uh, all these things like planning and engagement and uh, lowering the risk tolerance is gonna be really critical. The big driver of any new project is being able to build it at the low cost per square foot. Redevelopment, and this sort of pertains to, to uh, sites like Kearns, uh, you know, redevelopment is gonna be uh, some more likely to be in these categories of either mixed use, and that's not just, you know, these, these kinds of things, but also medical and community centers, uh, some schools, if, if enrollment is climbing, if the population's growing, uh, things like driving ranges and sports activities, uh, redeveloping for uh, creating parks and farmers markets and concert venues and so on, and really looking at implementing that live, work, learn, and play concept. Uh, other things that we're seeing in redevelopment uh, of existing buildings, uh, food and beverage uses, these experiential that I've talked about, the experiential uses, 
uh, last mile logistics. This is a conversion of anchor tenant stores and sometimes smaller stores that we've seen staple stores and so on be converted to last mile delivery points for people like Amazon. Uh, co-working space, uh, big, uh, sort of had a rough ride for a while there, but it started to stabilize, and I think that's going to be an important component in the post-COVID era, as people that can work from home are going to want to have, be able to go to an office once in a while, but not necessarily their own office, but a co-working space office. And of course, apartments or multifamily rental residential. This is just a quick rendering of a, a mall project we worked on. This was an enclosed mall. Uh, where we took off the roof, took away the first bay, uh, column of uh, bays in the storefronts, pushed everything back and created this. And I think you're going to see these kinds of conversions go on with some of these old mall properties. Uh, so advice for municipalities, you know, be proactive, uh, start to think about these things and don't, don't wait and, and assume the market will fix this, the market won't. You're going to have to be a participant in a lot of these things. Uh, look at your zoning and your permitting criteria and processes. Uh, the, the mantra that we like to say with municipalities is swift, simple, and certain. Make it a very swift, as fast a process as you can. Capital is chasing deals. Capital is looking for places to go. Uh, they're not going to wait eight or nine months or a year to get through an approval process. They want to be able to move a lot faster than that. So if you're trying to attract investment capital, make your processes uh, swift. Simple means the fewest layers of boards and commissions. You know, we've worked with communities that had one board and commission, did everything. Uh, we've worked with other communities that had 22 and 23 boards and commissions that uh, people had to go through to get an approval for a project. Certainty is key. Uh, if you have language that says that the Planning and Zoning Commission must consider the need for the use, that's not an objective standard. It's a, it's, it's an, a standard which really it's in the eye of the beholder. Or uh, something like must consider the character of the community. It's not an objective standard. And the problem with, with discretionary language like that is when investors see it, a developer or, and or his investors sees that, they usually will stop and they don't want to work on that kind of project in that kind of community. Because what it means to them is they could spend eight months getting through the whole process and on the last night someone can say, a planning and zoning commissioner can vote against it and say, I just don't see the need for the use or I don't think it fits the character of the community. So it's not an objective standard. Most environments, if you meet the qualifications, the criteria set out, you get a permit. In land use, you don't. And so your history of handling those kinds of things is critical. And investors are savvy to that. Now they look at that, they ask us questions about it, they want to know what the history is. So uh, be proactive in terms of looking at all these things. Incentives. I mean, we, we, we work on a lot of projects. Uh, we're the on-call services provider for, uh, just in this area alone, uh, East Hartford, Manchester, Hartford, uh, New London, which I guess is outside this area, Bloomfield, uh, and a number of other ones. Uh, every single deal we are working on right now utilizes incentives. There's some kind of tax deal. Uh, and the problem is here in North Central Connecticut, the cost of construction, the cost of development, isn't justified by the available rents. And that's, that's why the numbers don't work. And if you can't get to the return on equity numbers that they need to, to get to, and they can forecast it very easily, sometimes they ask us to do that underwriting. Uh, if you can't get there, I mean, the project's just not going to happen. So incentives, uh, whether it's a tax abatement, tax increment financing, a tax fixing agreement, a low cost or zero cost land sale, we're handling the Manchester Parkade deal right now. Uh, the land on that deal is uh, going to be sold for a million eight uh, to the developer, but the developer or the uh, town then has to turn around and put all the roads and sewers and utilities in, and the cost of that is a million eight. <laughs> uh, we're handling uh, East Hartford, the, the Showcase Cinema deal. Uh, they bought it for, uh, they've got, East Hartford's got about six million in that site. They bought it, cleaned it up demolished the site, uh, demolished the building, cleaned it up environmentally. So they've got about six million in it. Uh, we're working on, a, on an amenity rich apartment project there. Uh, the deal is, uh, it's all public, uh, the deal is a $1 sale to the developer and uh, there will be about $10 million in additional incentives added to that uh, to get that project. But that project will generate almost $2 million in taxes when it's fully developed. So that's kind of the focus. Uh, so incentives are just a, a part of the a landscape going forward. 
Uh, other advice, be flexible, create the, the, the research and the data that you need to market the site. Try to think a little bit like a property owner in terms of you know, creating value and how you're going to operate this. Uh, really work closely with the, the uh, constituents in your community, the ones I've listed here, Chamber of Commerce and so on. And uh, you know, when you're thinking about doing dispositions, our advice to communities is don't focus on, on getting some kind of you know, acceptable price for the land you're selling. Focus on the long-term creation of tax revenue. It's going to outweigh the cost, any, any of sale price you're going to get. Uh, land in Connecticut for development purposes is not selling for very high prices right now. And the market value of a piece of land is essentially the market value if it was clean and flat and, and uh, approved, minus the cost of demolishing what's on it and minus the cost of any environmental cleanup. So for most of these sites that we work on, that ends up being a zero-sum game. And that, so our advice is don't focus on trying to get a price for the property. Focus on what you can get developed there that's going to pay tax revenue. That, uh, it's going to pay it for the next 40 years. That's what you want to... Great. Bloomfield, uh, they, they, the town of Bloomfield gave a seven-year tax, uh, zero property tax, uh, to, for, to get that project going. Uh, it's generated an enormous amount of activity in the local restaurants, but uh, now that the uh, seven years has run out, that thing will create about a million eight a year in tax revenue. So substantial, about a $70 million project. Uh, we can kind of go over this real quickly. This is just stuff we do with some of our business owners uh, about how people are responding to uh, omni-channel retailing, which is online and physical. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, you know, this is this question of what wins, brick, uh, bricks or mortar, you know, online versus stores. And what we're finding is that they've got to go hand in hand. Uh, we call that the halo effect, uh, and the, 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 the third bullet point there is maybe the one I'd like you to remember, that opening a location in any market translates to an increase in web traffic of nearly 40%. So the, the best evidence of that is Apple stores. Apple, uh, you know, they're in the business of getting us to do everything online. On the one hand, on the other hand, they're also the largest volume retailer on a per square, sales per square foot basis in the U.S. by a huge margin. Uh, so, uh, things that we're going to see happening, fewer locations, smaller locations, locations that are perceived to be billboards more than they are delivery of goods, uh, the commodity transactions moving online, uh, you know, creating uh, an alignment with the social cause and so on. Uh, structuring for digital, but don't doubt the value of a physical, physical presence. Uh, and that's what's going to drive things going forward. So. If you can get good locations at lower cost, this is what retailers are looking for in a, mar in a market with emerging demand and the capital that's looking for the opportunities, then that's what's going to happen. Uh, we threw in this plural of anecdote as data. We spent a lot of time listening to what customers are saying because that's what's going to tell us what's going to happen uh, next. We do think that it's not the end of the cycle, as it says here. It's, really, it's just simply the end of the cycle, pardon me, not the end of the world and that there will be good environment uh, for opportunity. So let's talk about the Kern School. Just a quick summary uh, for the group. Uh, 1956 first, 1992 second, about 44,000 feet of uh, total building area. But in the way we measure it in terms of rentable area, it comes out about half of that. Uh, developable acres of the total site, there's two sections. One that's closer to the street of about five and a half acres one that's back a little bit, uh, if, if uh, you're familiar with this site, and I think you all are, there's a lot of wetlands on this site. And then the school was closed in 2016. Uh, there was a lot of alternatives that were discussed, and the town issued an RFP in 2020. That's when we responded. And, uh, you know, the, the way we work is a little different than what the way most, uh, well, a lot of brokerages work. We've done a lot of these kinds of assignments, sold schools in places like Groton and, and East Hartford, a number of different markets. Uh, you can't, properties like this, you can't just put a sign up on it, and, and that's what a, a broker is typically going to do. They're going to put a sign up on it and, and wait for the phone to ring. That's not a strategy. That's usually just going to mean years of sitting there with the building decaying as, as time. So uh, what we do is, we go into the market, do a deep dive into the demand, come up with an assessment of the demand, whether that's housing or retail or medical or industrial or whatever it might be, 
and we run down that list of the plausible market-driven uh, alternatives, and we start uh, doing two things. We do conceptual modeling, how much can you fit on the site, what can you build on the site physically, and financial modeling, you know, what's it going to cost you to do that and what's the return going to be. Once we've done all that, we put that together in a package, and then we start calling people we know. Uh, as opposed to putting it on CoStar and hoping somebody calls, Andy gets on the phone and calls five developers that he knows have the experience and the capacity and the money to do a redevelopment. I do the same things, other people in our office do it. And we all have a long network, uh, we've all worked in this business in this area for, for decades, so we, all, we have a long network of people that we know that we can call. And th the point of doing that is when we call them and we say, you know, it's, uh, it's Andy DeFato, I'd go to New York, we've got something you need to look at. They'll listen to us. And we can then follow up with the information on the market, the demand information, the uh, conceptual designs that we've done, the financial feasibility that we've done, and we can start answering questions. By doing that, we can get them to focus on the project. And also by doing that, we're taking a lot of the pre-development work and the pre-development risk out of the process. We're taking it on and getting it done. Uh, and that's the way we work. The difference is that you have to pay us to do that. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that on the, on the basis that maybe one day somebody will decide to buy the property and there will be a commission earned on it. Uh, we, can't, we can't work that way and it's not a successful way to get these things done, quite frankly. Uh, this, we put a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of time and effort into this and uh, we can't be in a position where it might take three or four years to sell the property and eventually it could go before town council and town council or the board of selectmen might say, well, we're not sure we want to do this deal and all our work turns into nothing. So uh, we work on, a, on the basis of a, uh, an advisory firm. We get paid for the work that we do as we go along. Uh, we began the work here in 2020, early uh, 2021 this year. Uh, we've done this work in the communities that I've mentioned uh, successfully, uh, sold a number of these projects and they're selling more of them as we speak. So where are we at? As I mentioned, the contract with, with you began in January. We're on a monthly retainer of 3,000, credited against 5% of the sales price or 50,000. Uh, the work is the things that I, I mentioned a minute ago, the market research, the conceptual designs, financial uh, uh, analysis, uh, and then doing this very targeted uh, marketing campaign. We do put up signage and we do flyers and we do website information, but that's really not where it happens. We, I don't think we've ever sold anything in this arena off a sign or a co-star listing. Uh, it happens because of sort of shoe leather. We, we work it, we talk to the developers, get them out here, show them all the material, answer all their questions. So we're, we're continuing to work, uh, do the work on it. Uh, Andy can, uh, uh, I think has provided you already with some information on where we're at. The, we did get this first offer to purchase in April 2021. Excuse me, can I just interrupt? Yeah. What offer was that? Yeah, in April. Yeah, we saw, well, it was the first offer, and, and uh, I think we showed it to the, the predecessor. Uh, it wasn't feasible. That's what happened. The, uh, they didn't, they decided not to go ahead with it. Uh, so it wasn't to the point where we could actually bring it to you and say it's a, it's a bona fide offer. It was a first proposal, I guess, is what I would call it. And it, once do you, did that go to you, no, Abby? No, I didn't actually see a formal offer. Yeah, it did. It's when I say an offer, it wasn't a formal offer. It was a, a first proposal, basically. Yeah, because I'm, I'm looking at that going, you know, I, I don't remember. Yeah, no, that's probably the wrong way to term it. Uh, you know, what happened with, with that uh, uh, potential buyer was he he made a uh, an initial offer before he had done all, any financial analysis. Oh. And we said, okay, you know, that, that let's, what, what do you need to know? Yeah. And we went through it all with him, and uh, by the time he was done, he said he couldn't go ahead with it. Yeah. I so, just I didn't remember. So yeah, no, that's fine. So we are continuing to work. So, so we might want to correct this because this is a public sure, yeah. document. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, good suggestion. Um, you know, in our world, uh, we, we get a lot of offers that are floated that really aren't formal offers. They're not, it's not a letter of intent. And by the way, even a letter of intent is, is non-binding. But uh, the... Uh, initial sort of uh, look that people will take at it, the, they'll give us, they'll throw a number out and the work will start. Yeah. And that's what, that's what all that means. Thank you. Um, and then there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of hand rolling, a lot of support. Uh, you know, we, what the way, it, unfortunately, the way it goes a lot of times is the 
developer will conclude that it doesn't make sense. And they'll show us, we'll ask them to show us the information why it doesn't make sense, and then we'll try to answer the questions and try to get to the point where we can get them to, to uh, uh, hopefully we can get the deal to the point where it does make sense. And an example of that, by the way, we've done a number of deals where the developer has come to us and said that their data, uh, their market data, doesn't, it shows that it won't work. And we've said, let's look at your data. Uh, our data is typically better, uh, so we will go back to them with better data and show them where they're wrong, and then we revive the deal again. So that's the way the, this whole discussion process goes. So we're, we're now in the middle of these ongoing marketing efforts, and uh, you know that's, I think we, we have one uh, potential developer who has maintained interest. He likes the market, he likes the site, he hasn't figured it out yet. Uh, we've gone back and forth with a number of uh, potential uh, conceptual plans. We've done some financial feasibility for him on the basis of those conceptual plans. And so far, we, I don't think we're there, quite there with the solution yet, uh, but we're, we're getting closer every time we work on this. And that, that's the way the process goes. I mean, it's just, there's nothing about developing in North Central Connecticut in a small market like Granby or any other ones that are similar uh, that make this stuff easy. I mean, you just have to keep working it and working it and working it, and uh, hopefully you get to something that uh, everybody agrees makes sense, and then, then you go to a contract, and that's what we hope to do. So, question and answers. Members of the board, questions? I do not, thanks. Not any, thanks. A lot of material. So, sure, I do. Um, so, you talked about the plural anecdote is data. You talked to 30 or 40 or some number of potential developers is what we understood, I think, from the last presentation that we had, right? And of those, only the one apparently had any interest and came here to show us something. So what did you learn from the other 39 or 29 or how many or what, what was well, the feedback? Well, we had a lot of things. Uh, uh, we had a uh, housing guy, an apartment developer up here. Uh, He's a Texas-based developer of a, a, what, what I've referred to as amenity-rich apartments. And uh, he's doing a couple of deals in the area. He's got uh, three projects, one in Massachusetts and two here in Connecticut. And we showed him uh, this site. Uh, he wanted to look at a couple of other sites. Uh, you know, he just said the market's too thin. It's just not enough people, not enough population. And, uh, you know, it's a shame because, I mean, he's, he's exactly the kind of guy that we thought would uh, be a great uh, partner with the town to develop residential development on the site. Uh, we went back to them with more research. Uh, what we find with some of these uh, guys is they, they will look at a trade area, and we use what, a, what's called a drive time trade area. And it usually is based on sort of 20 minute drive time or 23 minute drive time, depending on the geography. And uh, what we'll find is we'll find certain developers who will say, now, we use a 12 or 14 minute drive time. Well, if you use a 12 or 14 minute drive time, there's not enough people. I mean, the market's just too small. So we had to convince him that this was a market where a 23 minute drive time was realistic, because that's closer to a, a real Connecticut commute time from a work standpoint. And uh, he didn't buy it. <laughs> you know, he, he said, I get it, I understand, but he said, it's, the market's just too small. Uh, we've talked to a few people on the retail side. We never thought it was a great retail site. It's actually a pretty good retail site, but in this market, it's very tough to get anything done from a retail standpoint. Everybody's kind of standing on the sidelines. Uh, but, you know, the stop and shop across the street and TJ Maxx and some of the other activity, you know, it gives us a story to tell that we call that co-tenancy. That's a good thing. Uh, but we, uh, we, we pretty much struck out on anybody doing retail. Uh, and one of the issues there is the, uh, uh, average, uh, what's called AADT, the annual average daily traffic count on the adjacent roads is a critical number for a lot of these guys. And if you're below 20,000 AAD, AADT, they just won't even look at it. And that, that street's below that number, it's around 17,000. So it's not, not hugely below, but below enough that it, it just takes it off. We had a lot of people just say to us, you know, it's an interesting market, but I've got better markets. You know, I can go with, with markets that have greater traffic, higher population density, higher income, average household, whatever it is. Uh, better, closer proximity to uh, employment nodes, that's a big one. 
you know, there, there, are just a, there is a lot of opportunity out there right now. A lot of the money that we're seeing in deals is still going to the south. I mean, the markets in the south are just growing at such rapid rates. Uh, they they kind of look at the risk profile of that and say, well, if I build 350 units or 200 units of apartments in suburban Dallas, you know, it might, slow, it might lease up a little slower, but the growth is huge. I mean, the, the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth metro area adds about 100,000 net new jobs every year. I mean, the numbers are just huge. So they look at that and they say, gee, you know, I could build that uh, 200 units of apartments in suburban Dallas, it's bulletproof. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lease it up eventually. On the other hand, if I build it in Granby or a similar small market, you know, I could be waiting for a while. Like, it, it, uh, if I don't get this right, I could be leasing this thing up for two or three years, or the rents won't be there, or I'll have to give greater incentives to get it leased up. So the risk profile is a lot lower in some of these really high growth markets. And that's not Granby, that's just North Central Connecticut, quite frankly. Uh, so, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of people out here, uh, and I guess that's sort of the summary of the feedback we've got. The market's small, uh, it's a little distant from some of the big employment nodes, it's not on an interstate highway or close to an interstate highway, uh, so the traffic counts aren't, aren't where they'd like to be. Uh, it's just got a tougher risk profile. When you use the term uh, retail, in your presentation even it says kind of retail's rare or, or whatever, not, not there. Do you, does that have a different meaning than the, the three the three buildings with drive-throughs that weren't on the proposal from the from the developer that came here to talk to us. Is there yeah, a, what I said was retail of any scale. I mean, you're not going to see retail of any scale. You'll see small-scale retail. That was it. Uh, that no, was the private. It was the public presentation. If they showed the conceptual drawings and everything. Yeah. yeah, back a while ago. Yep. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, tractor supply, for example. I think tractor supply now is going into the old Blue Fox uh, rock and roll mm -hmm. place. You know, we're seeing that kind of stuff, and, and that, that's going to happen. I mean, those kinds of things are going to happen. Uh, auto parts guys, dollar stores, those kinds of things, that's still pretty active. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, we may see a proposal to do something like that. We may bring you something like that, and you can decide if that's what you want to do. But it's not, uh, it's not, a, a, re not a site from a retail standpoint that, that uh, is really appealing to anybody at the moment. A lot of vacancy. If you go down along Route 44 in, in Avon, I mean, even where the traffic counts are 26,000 a day, there's still a lot, of, a lot of vacancy. There's restaurant locations there that have been vacant for two years, two or three years. 10, 12. 10 or 12 years. <laughs> yeah. I, I know the one you're thinking. Yeah. My last question is, the, so the work that you've talked about, the market research, the conceptual designs, the financial feasibility analysis, are those all tangible things that we've received, we have physically in our possession? Is some part, of them part, we, we've shared with you, a, lo a lot of them are very specific to the, to the uh, question that, you know, we've been asked. Um, but, you know, it's all, you know, we, we might run five or six of those in an afternoon for a client or a potential client uh, developer. And, uh, I heard is that sort of in the beginning of the project you guys sat around and did some of this modeling to sort of create a profile of yeah, the that, property for the... Okay. That, well, you probably said, saw the flyer that has the research in it and so on that we used from the beginning. I saw a flyer, yes. Yeah, that's got a lot of the summary of, of the research and so on that we gotcha. put into it. Okay, thank you. Right. So, so one of the things I, I thought was interesting was your comments about the devaluation of commercial uh, real estate and, and how that's going to impact the tax base. And, and one of the criticisms of some folks has been that we have you know, too high a residential and not enough commercial. And <clears throat> what, what's, what do you think is going to happen to these towns that have 30, 40 percent? Uh, commercial is going to devalue by, pick a number, 50 percent. I guess their residential taxes are going to have to make up that difference. That's the difference. And, and do you think that's going to cause a huge problem with, with Connecticut residential real estate? Well, not just Connecticut. I mean, this is a nationwide thing. Uh, but uh, if you're a town that's got a regional mall, and uh, the regional mall is paying, you know, several million square, several million dollars in taxes, I think you got to assume that that number is going to go down substantially. I mean, if you're in Manchester, you know, again, this is you know public information. Right. The shops at Buckland Hills went into receivership earlier mm -hmm. this year. Uh, Manchester, we've been talking to Manchester about what that should be, what, what's the new value of that. 
I don't think we've yet to conclude a number because we don't know how far it might slide. Uh, but the, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good story. I mean, if you've got a regional mall property, uh, you know, and, and it's paying a big chunk of taxes, you ought to be assuming that that a big uh, uh, part of that's going to go away at some point, and that's just the reality. I, I spent a couple you know. decades in a town that relies heavily on a mall, and I'm sure it keeps people up at night. What's going to happen to West Farms? Right. Yeah, I mean, West Farms. Because be able to you post. Know, you have the lowest tax rate anymore with without a West Farms. Exactly. West Farms is, is the closest thing we have to a Class A property in East Market, and they've got a closed Lord and Taylor store there. You've got an, another anchor owned by J.C. Penney, which J.C. Penney, you know. They've had a lot of struggles financially mm -hmm. in the last few years. I think kind of skirted around the edge of filing Chapter 11. I don't think that story is over yet. You've got Macy's with two stores there. They've got two stores because they bought another department store. I can tell you, we worked with Macy's. I, I know one of the real estate guys from Macy's for 30 years. I mean, they don't, they don't typically want to have two stores in a mall, and that's just not an efficient way to operate. So you've got a five-anchor mall. One anchor's already vacant. J.C. Penney could go vacant, and you could lose Macy's, one of the Macy's stores. I mean, that's not a good story, no. you know? It's not us. It's not us. It's not us. Yeah, I mean, you have a much more balanced tax base, uh, and particularly on your commercial side. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't have a big bet on any one user, and I think that's a good thing in the current environment. Look at that. We're ahead of our time. <laughs> All right. I have one more question. If everyone else does. See you later. One more. Thanks. Just um, so, kind of, what's the next step in the next milestone? I think I asked you this the last time you were here. Like, when do we pull the plug and say, okay, you know, enough's enough? Well, that's your so call. I mean, we're next? still optimistic that we're going to be able to put something together and come back to you with a development plan, and then you'll have to decide whether it's a plan that you want to see go ahead. And I can't tell you today what the terms of that are going to be. Uh, you know, we're still going back and forth with this one. And, and uh, it, we're not focused on just this one potential developer. I mean, we're out, you know, Andy and I and others are out there talking about uh, not only this site, but other sites in the market all the time. The guy that I mentioned who was the uh, guy out of Texas, the housing guy, I keep trying to bring him back, you know. Cause I felt like we were so close with him uh, that we should keep going. And, and, you know, that's the way the business goes. You can talk to somebody in January and they'll say, no, I'm not interested. In November, when they haven't been, made their quota on deals and they're looking for places to put money, they'll say, what was that deal you showed me? You know, can you, can you bring? That's what we have to do. Sometimes timing is just critical. So I think we, you know, our, our program is quite frankly, you know, keep your head down and keep working. And uh, hopefully we're gonna be able to put a deal structure or, or in, in a terrific world, several, bring them back to you to think about them, and you can decide. I mean, it, it, that's not the only answer, as you know. I mean, you, you know, towns sometimes decide to turn it into public space or whatever. That's your call. I mean, uh, you know, and, and we can help you with sort of any of the solutions. Uh, you're our client. You know, our job is to help you. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'll look for a motion to move item D. <coughs> Move that we reordered the agenda to move item D to come after the second reports. Second. Motion second. Discussion seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Moving to town manager's report. Thank you. Um, tonight we have a, our short report. It is our monthly uh, oper budget operation statement for September. We've finished the first quarter of fiscal year 22 already. Time goes by when you're having a lot of fun. Um, but everything is on track, everything looks good. You have the, the written report in your packet. Our tax collection rate is on target, um, slightly up from where we have been in the past, so that's good. Everything looks good in the tax collector's office. Um, in terms of the revenues, a couple items to note here. Um, it positively, the, our pilot, our payment in lieu of uh, taxes for state-owned property has um, come to us $11,460 um, more than expected. The state changed how they do that. They changed it to a tiered pilot program. Don't ask me um, what that tier is and what it means and how it works because no one knows but the state. They did not share that with us, but we'll take the extra $11,000. Um, so that is positive news. 
Um, we are, um, there's certain things, I, one thing that I noted being a new user of this, this report, uh, open farm day, I was curious as to, you know, did the $1,300 received only come from possibly what happened on open farm day last month? And Kimmy corrected me and said that um, donations for that, that fund, that open farm day, come in the spring when donations are solicited. And then those donations from the, the spring carry over to the activities in the fall, which, you know, runs through two fiscal years. So it's hard to, to look at them, you know, kind of budget to budget. So that's why we're um, low there. Um, in um, miscellaneous account, the on page three, I just note that um, we have been able to receive um, miscellaneous uh, funds from profit distributions from Kerma, the Connecticut Interlocal Risk Management Association, our insurance company that's owned really by towns and cities here in Connecticut. And when they have extra profit, they give it back. So we were able to receive um, $32,000 on that. Uh, the transfers, you can see that we have um, 2,963,814. Two million of that is OPEB that needs to be transferred to OPEB. And um, the remaining almost million dollars is uh, to be used this year from fund balance. I'm sorry, should I, sure. should I ask questions? Yeah. Okay. How about the OPEB transfer? So sure. is there a reason that we're waiting? Yeah, the, re the, the re point was... Sure, we are. Um, remember last meeting we approved the OPEB trust? Ah. So we're, that does not um, commence until November 1st. So gotcha. once that's in place, Kimmy will make the transfer. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, in operations, everything again looks good for the first quarter. You know, we don't see things as quarters really in government uh, accounting and, and budgeting. Some things come in quickly, some things don't. Uh, some things are spent seasonally. I, I mean, uh, you'll see a lot of encumbrances have been put in place, and those encumbrances are generally salary, salary uh, adjustments that we um, assign to those different departments, and the rest are just open POs that that departments are working on. Um, on page five, on the last page, you'll see that in our capital and debt service, our capital plan is um, what we call small cap here in Granby is the, the million eight fifty, and that has been transferred to the capital improvement fund. We did that in September. And um, right now in debt service, we've only paid interest. Our next payment in February is interest and principal, so that number will jump up quite a bit. And Glenn, like you said, the, the, um, you mentioned the OPEB trust fund. At the bottom there, you see we have not expensed that. Again, we plan on doing that in November when Wells Fargo is all set up. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? Better not. No questions. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Kimmy in her office always do a fantastic job. Yes. Thank you. All right. Move to our select and <coughs> report. Um, first of all, I spoke with the DOT project super uh, for the center project that is due to begin uh, November 15th. So the center is, as he put it, going to be a mess. So uh, seek alternate routes if you can. That will be starting again uh, the week of November 15th. Um, we also will not have the next Board of Selectmen uh, meeting November 1st um, because it's the uh, night before elections um, and they set up in here, uh, or they use this space uh, as well for elections and it's just kind of a circus. Um, and also we have uh, a lot of great candidates in the room tonight. So I do want to remind folks to please vote November 2nd, uh, Tuesday, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. over at the high school. So if you can do that, that would be great. Like I said, we've got some great candidates here tonight. So I wish you all the best of luck. Um, also, just this being our last real uh, substantial meeting 
Uh, I just want to thank everyone. It's been my honor to serve as uh, first selectman. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and uh, so I do appreciate it. Uh, Glenn, thanks for the last two years. Ed, Sally, Mark, thank you for the last eight years and beyond. Erica, I wish you the best. <laughs> thanks. Um, I think we did a great job. I agree with Jenny uh, in hiring a great town manager. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. That's it. Thank got some in my eye, that's all it was, but anyway. It's allergy season. Uh, we'll start for uh, selectman reports. Uh, Glenn. I'll set, thanks. Okay, Ed. Well, <clears throat> it'd be hard to follow uh, Scott's uh, tears, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'd never come out of your eyes anyway. Yeah. No, they won't, but <laughs> I'll do my best. But. Uh, wow. It, it, it is our last meeting, and I really do want to thank the citizens of Granby for their confidence in me in the last 16 years, eight on the selectmen and eight on the Board of Ed. And for me, it was a very hard decision not to run again. And, and it's mostly been a pleasure and honor to serve Granby. And, and my, my heart has always been um, trying to do what's best for, for Granby with a lens of both now and in the future. And I hope our new officials after, after elections have the same view and, and value patience and reflection when weighing decisions and, and not just deciding based on the three people standing in front of them who, you know, are not happy or, and quite honestly, may never be happy. Um, and, and fortunately, uh, the overwhelming majority of citizens are, are pleased with the way our town functions. Our schools are great. Uh, we have fiscal soundness. We have a double A plus rating, which is on par with the United States government. Our parks, Holcomb Farm, which we, we had a tremendous uh, overview of tonight, et cetera. And, and they enjoy a, a great quality of life, the safety, the open space, the tranquility and peace of our town. Uh, unfortunately, they're silent most of the time, except when you go to Geisler's or the package store. Then you run into them, they say, hey, you know, thanks, things are really good, and we, we really appreciate your time. Um, but we do have a much smaller and vocal group that wants us to be something something else, you know, Blueback Square, apartment complexes, drive-throughs, a trash plant. And I think we heard a pretty good indication of uh, what can happen with a Blueback Square on, on the devaluation over time, and, and that's a pretty startling story. And, how it can impact your tax bases. And, you know, I, I implore the leadership, uh, to, to future leadership, to follow the roadmap of what made Granby a great place to live and, and listen carefully to the silent majority of citizens who love our town very much. Um, there's nothing wrong with safety, peace, tranquility. Look at all the New Yorkers that are rushing to the countryside. Um, but I guarantee that, you know, it will be sorely missed when it's gone, and you can never recover that. Um, I, I do want to thank a few people. First of all, I want to thank Matt Woodkin and Ben Perrin for convincing me many years ago at a party to join them on the Board of Education. Uh, it was the start of a long, long ride in, uh, in public service, and believe it or not, we're still great friends. Um, and, and Al Wilkie and Mike Worko for their guidance and friendship through the years. And Jim Lofink, who's also in the audience tonight, from uh, my friend from across the aisle for many spirited discussions uh, along, starting back in Holcomb Farm and uh, on your service in the board, et cetera. And the board and, um, for their friendship and, 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 and work through the years. And of course, Scott, um, it's been a true pleasure to serve alongside of you. So again, thank you again to the citizens for electing me and, and allowing me to serve. You're going to cry yes, later. No. I know. I'm sorry for taking up too much time. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting antsy. I can feel it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hey, even I'll miss you guys. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. At this point, I will look for what? A motion. Motion, motion to recess. To no, people. motion to. Yeah, we got it. Executive, executive session. Executive session. Right. Take it away, Mark. So moved. A second. <laughs> Discussion? 
All just, I, I would just mention for the minutes that uh, executive session will be limited to the town, the board of selectmen, town manager, director of community development, and the Goldman and York consultants. Yeah, right. How about, did uh, John have anything to say? Bill? John? John Bell? Isn't he here? John. Oh, John Oh, student. gosh, oh. yes. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> recognize John. <laughs> like, look. John, anything um, to add? Student uh, leads. I thought I would just say, like, congratulations. I've been here for, like, a year but I've learned a lot from you guys so thank you but um at the high school last week there was PSATs for all freshmen sophomores and juniors and as far as I know everything went well everybody took them um, last weekend or Saturday was homecoming which was the first school dance in two years so that was exciting and the um, student government and the teachers and everything ordered food trucks for everybody and everybody had a great time. Um, I think the last time I reported there was, I said all the sports teams were undefeated and unfortunately only the football team is undefeated, but um, the girls volleyball team is 13 and one, the boys and girls soccer team are both seven and three and I think the girls field hockey team just won earlier today, so they're um, uh, I think eight and three. Wow. Now, so Granby's still the top of the um, fall sports. Um, and then moving forward, it's the end of quarter one, I think in about two weeks. Um, and it flew by for everybody, it always does. But um, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thank you for this. All right, Mark, we'll have to do this again. <laughs> I'd like to move to the executive session. Second. Discussion, seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention. Carries. Thank you. Good night.